So thank you guys for um, agreeing to participate in this fun adventure. Um, do, do either of you have a preference to serve as sort of chairperson, acting chairperson to run the meeting? What does it involve? It involves opening the meeting, announcing this is the um, bylaw regulation subcommittee of the Conservation Commission. It's January 7th, 2022, and we're going to be discussing the bylaw regulations. Um, we'll be reviewing various sections to revise. We'll be taking public comment if there is any. The proceedings are recorded. We'll be taking minutes and then just sort of going through the process as we would during a regular Conservation Commission meeting, but it's not as formal because we don't have public hearings. I'll do it unless Leroy wants to oh, fight for that. Okay. So I'll give it a go. All right. All right. I don't know what to say though. You right, we'll I'll just, just, just... The or can I skip it? What'd you say? Should I say what you just said? I don't think or, you need to. Okay, I'll just say good. that you're I'll just say in the notes that you were appointed, you know, chairperson to run the meetings. And um yeah, I think that's fine. Okay. Um Okay, so um, let me just, I'm just gonna pull up the agenda because I forgot what I even put on it, to be honest with you. Um, I know appointing a chair was, um, okay, open meeting, appoint chair, review existing bylaw regulations. So, um, Leroy, before you joined, I was just kind of explaining to Michelle um, the history of the bylaw and the regulations. So I'm not sure the exact year that the bylaws were created, but there was um, a bylaw created, which is, which is part of the wetlands bylaw is part of the town's general bylaws. And then as part of that, the Conservation Commission held public hearings and drafted, created a, um, the bylaw regulations. And the bylaw regulations basically promulgate the bylaw. So it tells people who um, wanna file a, cons uh, a permit with the Conservation Commission, what is required that's more strict than the state um, in the town of Amherst. And so that was created and it's, it was created, I'm not sure who created it, but it was created and then it's since been revised a couple times. The latest version is from 2014. That's the latest amended and approved version of the bylaw regulations. Once we finalize any revisions that we're making to this, the bylaw regulations, the Conservation Commission will hold a public hearing and make the document available for the public to review and take any public comment on it, and then they would motion to approve it, and then they would come. They would then be amended again, um, and they would come into full effect. Um, the The current version from 2014. Let's start there because that's what we're working with. Beth Wilson, who was the former wetlands administrator, worked with Bryony Angus, who was the former chairperson of the Conservation Commission, as well as it looks like somebody named Rob, I'm assuming that's Rob Mora, our building inspector, went through and edited the document. Um, the um, bylaw regulations would like track changes. And um, when I started in um, September of 2019, I was handed the markups. And Beth and I have gone through the markups together. And we did, I think prior to you starting Leroy, we held one meeting with the Conservation Commission where we reviewed some of the markups that Beth and Bryony and Rob had made to the document. At that point, we kind of hit this crazy um, point where business exploded and I lost track of it up until now. And so this just seems like the perfect time for us to um, take another look at it. So I just wanted to give a little history in case anybody's watching because this is going to be recorded and posted and just so that people have uh, the history of the whole process. So that being oh, um, when that 
that one meeting we saw you said maybe right before I started so a couple years ago yeah I want to say it was late 2019 early 2020 I guess I'm just kind of wondering uh, like is that process the open-ended we can just continue and should we is this starting fresh and new we're going to start fresh for a couple reasons. Um, the whole point of that was basically exactly what we're doing right now. And what, what was determined by that was basically, we don't have enough time during conservation commission meetings to go through this line by line. And also um, we have a very different complement of board members at this point as well. At that point in time, the intention was really um, <clears throat> sort of let's just approve what's been done thus far. And since that time, it, two years have over two years have passed, I've had a chance to work with this bylaw and I see that there's some very glaring errors with it, as well as some very glaring errors with the revisions. Not that there's anything wrong with the revisions that were done per se, but that looking at it from a holistic standpoint, there are some legal issues with some of the language. And I'll go through that with you. And if we can dig in, I think you'll start to see what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, we're just gonna start from scratch, beginning of the document. Now, <clears throat> I've worked with myself three different wetlands bylaws uh, for three different, well, the, actually Amherst is my fourth community that I've worked in. Um, is different bylaws, bylaws and bylaw regulations that I've worked with. And I've also reviewed bylaws from several other towns to get a sense of what their bylaws are like. Um, so my goal here is to organize, get these bylaws so that they're legally defensible should we have an appeal and make them succinct, short and sweet. There's a lot of I'm going to have trouble saying this word, superfluous, superfluous language in here, extra things that really we don't need. So for example, duplications of definitions that are in the Wetland Protection Act. We can refer to all definitions are as stated in the Wetland Protection Act with the exception of the ones noted below and state the ones that are specific to our bylaw. We don't have to restate everything that's in the Wetlands Protection Act. Um, so we're going to go page by page. Now, this morning I met with a town attorney to review this, and he had a lot of the same comments that I did, um, which was very encouraging. <laughs> Made me feel like, okay, I'm on the right path here. Um, and so I'm going to cover some of what he did. My goal is to go try to get through 10 pages today. This is a 40-page document. If in the course of two months we can get through the entire document, what I'd like to do is get my markups to the town attorney, then have him mark them up. And then once he marks them up, we'll have sort of a clean version that we can review again. And then if you guys have any additional changes you want to make at that point, or if you want to make any changes now, let's do it. Okay. Does that sound like a good plan? Yeah, I like it. Yeah. Okay. And I'm not a lawyer, but I was of the same mindset. My first major complaint was just a lot of redundancies. Yeah. Yeah, and this, this document has a lot of redundancy. Um, so the first is um, there was no table of contents at the beginning of the existing um, bylaw regulations. And so there's a table of contents added. Now this is gonna need to be edited because we're editing all the sections at this point. But that's one thing that I think is really important, the table of contents. And also I would recommend that we break this document up into sections. Now, if you guys wanna take a look at like the Northampton, um, wetland protection bylaw regulations or the South Hadley wetland protection bylaw regulations, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, very similar to the way that they do mass general law. And it's basically, if you want to look at a specific section, it's hyperlinked. So you click on that specific section and it takes you to that specific section, as opposed to just having it written like one large document, which makes it really difficult to scroll back and forth between sections. Um, if you guys have a problem with that, we don't have to do it, but it would be my recommendation just to kind of keep things really tight and organized. Um, the other thing is 
we need to do some checks and balances with the bylaw regulations against the bylaw. So like the first thing we did this morning, and this is, this is an example, a lot of communities regulate in their wetland bylaw and bylaw regulations, regulate buffer zone just as we would a resource area. So for example, we regulate bordering vegetated wetlands and bordering vegetated wetlands has a hundred foot buffer. Under local bylaw, that buffer is supposed to be regulated in the same exact way as the resource area itself in that it has, <coughs> um, you know, the definition, the general performance standards, and those things are all sort of our expectations for work that's done in those buffer zones. So that's one section that we might need to add to these regs. Um, but again, we're going section by section, so let's just handle it that way. So this is the new um, uh, table of contents. <laughs> now, just in the first paragraph, um, the superfluous wording is, is an issue. Like here it says, complement and amplify the bylaw. And, you know, that's not necessary language. When these regulations are adopted, they have the full force of law, period. There's no amplifying or complementing or anything like that. Um, so th that's what a lot of the markups are. Now, my markups are in pink. The blue markups were done by others. Can I just um, interject for a second? Please, please um, stop anytime. I, I know that um, you wanted to save us from having to review it, but I think for future meetings, it would be helpful for me to be able to see the markup so I could consider them sort of in my own pace rather than just the scroll down. Like, I don't, I don't have any problems with what we're going over yet, but, yep. um, you know, we're trying to be expedient in our one hour Yep. So it would be helpful for me to just flag anything that I had questions about beforehand and speed through it during the meeting. Okay. Okay. Um, that makes yeah, a lot of sense. I, I thought, that was my understanding, Aaron, that that was coming and it just wasn't quite ready yet. But yeah. if, if that wasn't coming, then I'm of the same opinion. I would love to have a copy of what you got going on. Okay. So my only suggestion on that is because it's it's a working document and there's so many markups is if I send you a version and you have edits to it that in that next round that we cover all of your edits and we can incorporate it into this document. Now, I know we can merge in Word edits. So like if you have an edit, Michelle has an edit, we can merge those all into one document. But my preference would be if you have a, a change that we talk about it collectively and make those edits. And I think for Agreed. the next the next meeting, what we should do is I'll send you this today as it stands right now and just focus on pages one through 10. You guys mark it up if you want to and we can cover those markups at the beginning of the next meeting before we jump into the second section. What if instead of markup, we use just comments to, I-, I That's fine. That's completely. I think fine. that would probably be cleaner, and I, I'm assuming we're not going to have huge changes. So. Yep. Okay. All right. That sounds fine. I think my only it's like workflow is my worry because I'm I'm scheduled to meet with the town attorney at 9:30 before we meet, and the reason we didn't get to this before it was just a workload issue. Like I could never. So I'm I'm going through this as we meet. <laughs> so it's a little bit like putting the cart before the horse. I would love to have all this marked up before we even met but I have to do it kind of um, in tandem. Okay, so like as per next week, we'll be going over 10 to 20. Would you be no. able to send us? What, what we'll plan to do next week, Michelle, just to give you a chance to address that comment, I'll send it to you immediately following this meeting and you can see the edits. You review, um, you could review one through 10 or one through 20, whatever you want, and then, um, just bear in mind that pages uh, 10 through 20, I'm going to be marking up with the town attorney um, prior to our next meeting. So, um, well, like immediately prior to our next meeting. Yes. Yeah. So, if you, this is how I would recommend we do it. I'll send it to you now. You can look at one through 10. At our next meeting, we'll review your comments on one through 10 because you're going to get kind of a thorough overview right now. We don't have to mark it all up. We'll review one through 10 sort of 
just based on your comment areas. And then we'll move on to 10 to 20 after that. And then I'll send that to you after you can comment and then we'll do the same thing at the next meeting so that you have a chance to really have a broad okay. view of um, comment. So it'll sort of be our after the fact comments. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess that's none of that's very ideal, is it? Um, well, I mean, the other thing is I can just send it to you and you can mark it up, but bear in mind when I go through it with the town attorney, entire sections are getting swiped out. Right. Like for example, for example, exception exemptions, which right now is called exceptions. It should be exemptions. It should match the wetland protection act regs. Um, and so that section is going to come out and just refer to the wetland protection act because there's a legal issue with the way it's written right now. Okay. So, so well, you might, well, yeah, we can just do as you suggested, but maybe give us a heads up on like, we're completely revising this section at our next uh -huh. meeting. So okay. Okay. Bear it in mind or something. But yeah, okay. um, I don't have any problems with this, this text change on this page. I didn't, you know, I guess we have to figure out how we're going to move through this, but yeah, well, we have, we have plenty of time. We actually, so that four meetings is only two months worth of meetings. We have an additional two months. So we're going to get very intimately involved with this document. My, my suggestion is let's go through it first pass. Look at just the general changes. Then let the town attorney have at it. Let him remove the superfluous language. Let him remove entire sections. Then let you guys really dig into the document. And if you want to make changes or think something's off, then we'll do it in those second two months, if that makes okay. sense. And, sure. then the, and then the final document would be what we send to the Conservation Commission as the finish markup. Okay, let's move. Right. Okay. Okay, so um, I just wanna talk about this because you guys are fairly new to the commission and this document is supposed to sort of follow the same format of the Wetland Protection Act. Now under the Wetland Protection Act, we have eight interests that the Conservation Commission is charged with protecting. Um, and these interests are repeated here, but there's also additional interests listed. So let me see if I can remember the Wetland Protection Act ones. Public and private water supply, protection of groundwater, flood control, storm damage prevention, <coughs> um, fish and wildlife habitat, and I think rare species habitat. Mm, I might be missing one. There's eight interests. One of them is protection of shellfish, which actually refers to coastal. Um, but you can see there's a couple additional ones like erosion and sediment control is an additional um, interest. Uh, storm, storm damage prevention is well in Protection Act. Protection of water quality, which to me is duplicative of the top one. Um, and then agricultural value, aquaculture value, and recreational value. Those are specific to Amherst, okay? <laughs> Um, statement of jurisdiction. So what this seeks to basically say is these are the resource areas that we have jurisdiction over as a conservation commission. And um, it basically puts into a tidy package what qualifies as say BVW or IVW. Um, so bordering vegetated wetland or isolated vegetated wetland. Um, some of these are different than what's covered in the Wetland Protection Act. So for example, vernal pools are not regulated the same way under the Wetland Protection Act. They're actually um, not jurisdictional under state law, which is very interesting. Um, there's other examples of that, um, but the, again, these blue edits were made prior to, to me. Um, one comment I have is vernal pools, we should insert whether certified or uncertified because a lot of people will point to certified vernal pools only. And in this case, both should be regulated. Um, also, this is where the issue with us um, having jurisdiction over the 100 foot buffer, just as we would 
a resource area under our bylaw regulations. And that's very important because let's just use an example, a clear cut of a slope forest where buffer zone only is being impacted. There's clear impacts to the resource area. And so treating that buffer as a resource area is very important. Um, I'm not gonna go through every single change. I'm just kind of going through this generally speaking first time through. And I'll, I'll touch on the big major changes. Um, so exceptions and variances. The first thing is these, this needs to be broken into two separate sections because what they call exceptions is actually exemptions under the Wetland Protection Act. And so my suggestion would be change exceptions to exemptions. So that language is, um, and that was the town attorney's recommendation as well. So that they, they are, the definition is the same for the, the same for the both. Um, so break them off into separate sections because variances and exemptions are two very different things. Exemptions is something where you do not need to file a permit. A variance is where you're asking for an exception to the rules. And so that's why coupling them in the same section is very confusing. Um, again, the comment about e exceptions versus exemptions. Um, <clears throat> this entire section needs to be revised as highlighted in pink. Um, you can see the markups previously in blue from um, Beth, the former chairperson. Um, this is, this is the section here and I'll send it to you so you can have a look at it. Um, this, this one down here, section E, this is the one that really caught my attention as being something that was like, what are they talking about? Um, other than as stated in these regulations, exceptions provided in the Wetland Protection Act and regulations shall not apply under this bylaw. <clears throat> From our attorney, he stated, uh, let me see. Hold on one second. I want to get his exact language on this. Um, as a matter of law, the town cannot waive a, st a state exemption. So we, this is not legal. And this is really important because it's, it really questions the credibility of this bylaw as a whole. So if somebody, if we denied something or if we didn't allow something or whatever the case, and we issued an enforcement order, let's say, and that enforcement order went to court, the court system would throw it out and it would just, it, it doesn't look good for us. Obviously, we got a lot more to look at, talk about next time. But as to that one being major, I'm in total agreement. That's pretty basic why we can't overrule the state. Uh, Michelle, you feel the same way on that? Definitely. Um, yeah. All right, I'm just taking notes here as we go. Okay, so um, variances. Here's another issue, major issue with this. And this was something that actually the town attorney brought up. The variance, as it's put in here, and part of this, it says, it says, edited by Rob. So Rob is the building inspector, who is the zoning enforcement officer. Now, zoning enforcement officer looking at this is going to look at this very similar to a zoning bylaw. The way that this is written is written exactly as a zoning bylaw for a variance for a zoning law. And <clears throat> variances under wetland bylaw regulations are different. And so the town attorney said, his name is Alex, by the way, Alex Weissite from KP Law, um, Copelman and Page Law in Boston, who's the um, municipal attorney for us. He is going to find language that is appropriate for a wetland bylaw to insert here, because as edited, as originally drafted, this is not appropriate for a wetland bylaw. And I know, you know, how I noted, like, there's a long run on sentence here. There's like so many examples throughout this bylaw where 
the way that it's written needs to be tightened up, shortened, made succinct. The grammar, the grammar needs to be um, improved because it's just um, <coughs> problematic. Um, again, here's another comment. The variance shall expire on a date specified by the commission no later than three years from the date of issuance of the permit and may be reestablished only after notice of a new hearing pursuant to this section. If a variance is granted under the, wet, under the Wetlands Protection Act and or under the wetland bylaw, it, is, it runs with the permit, period. So if, for example, somebody gets an order of conditions, we'll say UMass because we just issued the UMass order of conditions for um, the housing pro or the student housing project that's along Tanbrook. <clears throat> Let's just say we granted them a variance. Their permit is good for three years. Let's say they don't finish construction, but they're three quarters of the way through construction. And they come to us and say, we need an extension on this permit. Extending that permit would automatically extend the variance that was granted by the commission. So the variance is not a separate permit. It is tied directly to the Wetland Protection Act permit and the conditions of the bylaw. That is different from zoning because in zoning, a variance is an actual permit. And so that's why it's confusing here. And clearly somebody who was involved with zoning was assisting with this bylaw construction. Is there any intent there to maybe like, um you know, have additional oversight after three years to maybe reevaluate what the variance was initially issued for? Or do you, do you assume this is just sort of a, a zoning language thing? I mean, I'm, I guess I'm questioning what the intent was of this, or if it was just that somebody most familiar with zoning wrote it. Was possibly their intent to have some more oversight to monitor the conditions of the variance? Um, so, so similar to, okay, I, I'm not sure I understand your question entirely, but I'm gonna to try to answer what you said. So when we issue a, let's say, so we get a notice of intent filing and we issue an order of conditions, right? So the order of conditions is our permit. In zoning, when somebody files for a variance, they're granted a variance by the zoning board. And that variance allows them so, and, and it, it harkens back to the sections up above that I was talking about that are specifically coming from the zoning bylaw. The reason that, that variances are granted are, so for example, if under zoning, there are certain lot setbacks. So you can't build within, let's just say, cause I don't know exactly what the setbacks are and they vary by, um, zoning district. But let's say there's a 20 foot setback from a property line. So you couldn't build your house right on top of your property line and your neighbor couldn't build their house right on top of the property line because your houses would be like this, right? But let's just say you have some feature on your property owing to topography or let's say there's like ledge over 90% of your property and there's only one place on the property you can put your house the zoning board can override those property setbacks and issue you a variance so that you can build there. Because if you don't do that, if they don't do that, then it's basically a taking of your property, right? And I'm talking about this all in theory, just to explain specifically, to answer your question, Michelle, um, I'm not a zoning specialist by any stretch, but the reason that they issue the variance is so that people can in very select and specific situations override the bylaws so that people don't lose all value of their property if there's some condition on the property that they have no control over. Um, and I'm not talking about people creating their own hardship here. So for example, let's say you have a large parcel and 90% of it is wetland, but you have only like one little sliver, which is upland access. If somebody carves up that lot and sells off their upland access. That doesn't mean all of a sudden they have license to carve through the wetland to access the property. They've created their own hardship. But if the lot has been created since 1900 and that's the only way to access their property because it's a, it's a grandfathered situation, so to speak. It's complicated. It's a very complicated okay. situation. I think with lots of I've, 
I think maybe I understand that the variance sort of refers to static conditions and maybe the conditions of the permit would then refer to more like ecological conditions and would have to be reassessed every three years. And this I, is why, and this is why I think it's important for our review and you guys spending your time, personal time reviewing this, that we wait until after I go through and KP Law goes through because this variant section is a section that's going to change dramatically. Okay. And I'll I let, don't I'll want to move through it then. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so competent source, I inserted that we should define this. And this is really important, really, really, really important competent source. And we should repeat this again and again, wherever we can, because <sighs> I can't tell you how many times since I've been doing this that somebody will come along and say, oh, I can delineate a wetland, no problem. And I'm like, well, what's your experience? Oh, well, I took a class, you know, or something like that. And I mean, even people who've been doing this for 20 years, sometimes um, there, there have been instances I've run into where people who have been in this industry for 20 years can't identify a wetland plant. Um, and so a competent source for us to have a solid definition of that, I think is very important because the commission could say if an application comes before them, who, who did this delineation and what is their experience? And if they come back and say, well, they, you know, um, they didn't graduate high school, uh, they, um, you know, um, took a field class in botany um, in, 1962, and uh, yeah, that's his, their experience, then you can say, well, I don't think they're really qualified to be doing this and ask for somebody else or a peer review or something. <clears throat> um, this section, very, <laughs> very uh, tough section. Again, there's consistency issues with the bylaw. Some of the terminology that's used doesn't correspond to the bylaw. And also um, there are definitions here that differ from the Wetland Protection Act that from an accuracy standpoint that need to be corrected. Really what we should be doing under definitions, the first subsection under definition should state all definitions are presumed to be, to be the same as the Wetland Protection Act definitions unless otherwise noted. And then we should have a sh very short section of definitions, which again, going back to vernal pools, right? When we say vernal pool, the example of vernal pool would be uh, certified or potential you know, so that it's clear that we're taking a step further than the Wetland Protection Act in terms of protections. But there's a lot here. Um, there's a lot of um, language. I, this is another example. I added in clear cutting of vegetation and conversion of land cover types as a example under alter and that's very important because we recently had an example of a proposed clear cut and when people clear cut for development they're going to say there's no alteration taking place to the landscape and clearly there is a very huge alteration taking place to the landscape and so I feel like it's important for us to include that here now <clears throat> if we include this here that also means that we have to go back to our other section of exemptions and specifically state that clear cutting is allowed if it's part of a, uh, an approved DCR forest cutting plan, not for development, that that would constitute an alteration. Do you guys have any questions about that? Um, I agree about that. And I'm just wondering from like a forestry terminology perspective, if we should have a clear cutting and or, I mean, I actually don't know what the right term would be, but clear cutting is one type of cut, but then there's cuts that are like um, nursery cuts where it's basically a clear cut, with like five trees left standing. Yep. So I wouldn't want like too much wiggle room. So maybe getting, I don't know, someone to weigh in on clear cutting and or like removal of, you know, X percent of vegetation or I don't know, something that doesn't call out clear cutting as like a 
standalone um, definition, if you know what I mean. Hold on one second, I'm just writing this down. I, that sounds, that's a phenomenal suggestion. Stand okay. Um, so weigh in on forest cutting in terms of, so you're talking about under the agricultural exemption specifically state, these types of cuts are cuts that can be approved under DCR forest cutting plan, but not refer to it specifically as clear cutting like more the industry standard of what the definition of clear cutting would be under the forestry standards? Well, I think under forestry standards, clear cut does mean something, but in yep. like if I'm, I guess I'm saying in respect to um, like these exemptions, what well, the example that you're talking about where someone wants to clear cut for development, mm -hmm. well, they may say that it's not a clear cut, that it's like a nurse tree cut, but it's essentially a clear cut with five trees left standing. But if we call out clear cutting as the thing they can't do, could they potentially get around that by leaving, doing a nurse tree cut? Does that make sense? So I guess, okay, can you scroll up? What's the name of this um, section? I mean, we're, we're Definitions. calling out- yeah, okay. It's definitions so, of alteration. And I don't mean to imply that you couldn't do a clear cut. It just means that if you clear cut, you're altering a resource. Right. But I, I guess I want to make sure that it's not just clear cutting that would alter a resource. It's like, um, what you mean by clear cutting is like the removal of the majority of vegetation on a site, right? That's kind of what you're referring to. So yep. something... Yeah. Um, and we would probably have to be more specific than majority because yeah, the clear yeah. cut would no. be like... I, I, I'm picking up what you're putting down, and I think that the that using the term clear cut is the problem here. We need yes. to be more specific about or, what a clear cut is. Or um, right, or less specific than clear cut because clear cut itself is a term that means a specific thing. So if we say right. clear cut, then it excludes things that in the spirit of this one line should be there, such as the removal of 90% of vegetation or something. Is that coming through? And and Leroy is a forestry guy. So he oh, probably Leroy, knows. weigh in then. <laughs> You're new not really. Um, <laughs> I am wondering though, are we not, the, the reason I really like this language, Aaron, is because are we not very well covered by the ending, the conversion of land cover type? It would cover everything from a clear cut to an S3 cut to any majority change in the forest is going to change the land under even if you just left it there and grow back as meadow or whatever for another 20 years so i don't know i mean i think i'm, I'm with you in sentiment michelle but i think we might be covered by that second half the conversion, yes, conversion. Land kind of land. yeah and i'm with you maybe we should drop the specificity of clear cut but i think that keeping the conversion of land covered kind of opens it up to a lot of things yeah, I think that's an excellent point, Leroy. I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm not in forestry, but I mean, well, let's 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 explore both. I'll see what I can find. Okay. And I know I like somebody to interpret that. You know, like a nursery cut. The intention is that it reforests itself, so it's like a temporary conversion of land cover type, um, not a permanent one. So. It, Right. I guess I'm just trying to like find the poke the holes through there because of the potentially large implications. But it, yeah, if someone, <laughs> could weigh you guys, in. you guys are awesome. This is like exactly what we needed to to do. Um, to that end, Michelle, then could we, if we're looking at the line right now, version one cover types, could we say temporary or permanent? Without yeah, I help? think I think that's good. Um, language to to put in there and we can get other people to like weigh in on it yeah so i'm gonna flag this one um and i will look into this more i actually know somebody who is like a who has decades of forestry um experience who is really really well respected um in the forestry community and i could ask him um his advice on this, like how to 
wordsmith it and come back with suggestions when we revisit this section. Okay, so there's some issues like, okay, so I didn't make the edits in blue, but I'm asking why was this section removed? I guess th there's a couple issues with this and I just wanna point this out. So these, these definitions again, should harken back to the Wetland Protection Act definitions and also be consistent with the Wetland Protection Act. And this is one of the examples, areas subject to flooding. There's no areas subject to flooding under wetland protection. It's either bordering land subject to flooding or isolated land subject to flooding. So having something inconsistent like this opens up a lot of holes in the regulations. Um, sorry, I just wanna just make sure that if there's any attendees, um, I'm gonna, Michelle, I'm gonna make you a co-host so that you can see attendees. Cause when I'm sharing my screen, I can't see if there's any attendees. And if anyone pops in from the public, we might wanna seek their, you know, if they have comments on anything. Okay. When do we do that at the end? Do we leave five minutes at the end for that or what? You can do it however you want. People could raise their hand throughout as we're doing reviews. As we go through this and people become aware that we're reviewing the bylaw, people might join. Um, you could say people can raise their hand throughout, or you could say save 10 minutes at the end for questions. It's totally up to you. I'll keep an eye. It's just us for now. It is. Yeah. Okay. And remind me to make you co-host if you can at the beginning of meetings. Um, so, okay. So here's another example. Best available measures, best management practices. That is a standard state term for using the best possible practice for whatever we're doing. And that refers back to everything, stormwater, site management, everything, best available measures is just inconsistent language. So we want to eliminate that wherever possible. Um, this is another one and we're going to, my, the town attorney is going to help me with this one, but the buffer zone, um, the area of land extending hundred feet horizontally from the boundary. I want to, um, get some cl clarification and and refer to this exactly how we're defining it and see how the wetland protection act defines it because the boundary <coughs> should be measured perpendicular from the boundary it shouldn't be measured horizontal i mean i don't know i don't know exactly how the the language refers to it but i want to make sure that we're consistent with state and also that it's written defensibly all permit types should go back to wetland protection act Um, some of these are just, you know, I don't know. There, there was literally over 800 edits to this document already, just to give you a sense. <laughs> wow. In 40 pages, over 800 edits. Um, okay, extension permit. This is one that has created a ton of confusion <laughs> just in my two years of tenure. I've had people come to me and ask for extensions on determinations of applicability. Those are permits that cannot be extended. There is no extension to a determination. If we are providing a definition for extensions, it should be extensions on orders of conditions and extensions on orders of resource area delineation. Um, hold on, I just thought of something. I need to make a note of for later. Um, and to that point, I just wanna mention something. So we can't extend just any permit. It's only very specific permits that can be extended and we should be being explicit about that in the regulations. The other thing is, I'll just use um, abbreviated notice of resource area delineation as an example or orders of resource area delineation. Okay. Um, and actually, it would apply to orders of conditions as well. It really depends on the context of the permit. But this is a place we may want to put a placeholder for further discussions when we come back to this sort of in the second round of reviews that we do. And I would really recommend that you guys put this in your notes to comment on. This happens a lot. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Uh, I'll use Amherst Hills. Uh, I don't know. I think Leroy, you came in on the end of that. That was the Tofino application um, out near Amherst Woods. 
This was a permit, Michelle, that was issued in 2002 that is still valid. And the commission just kept issuing extension after extension. And I'm talking just no looking at the property whatsoever, just issue an extension, just issue an extension. And the permit is still valid. And what's happened is over time, a vernal pool developed in the middle of the property. And under our bylaw, we have a hundred foot no disturb around vernal pools, but a lot of the lots, house lots were within a hundred feet of that vernal pool. And so I would re highly, highly recommend that the Conservation Commission, if they are ever going to consider extensions of any sort on an ANRAD or a ORAD or an order of conditions, it requires a review process not just an issuance of a permit. And I, I would never allow that to move forward. He, like as in my tenure on the serving the board, I would never allow that to move forward without checking it. Um, but there are so many instances where that the reason that permits are only valid for three years is because resources change. Let's say a beaver moves in and builds a dam and then all of a sudden you have a huge impoundment. That can happen within six months. And so, Four years after the permit is issued, if the if if the commission just goes, oh yeah, issue an extension, and then you all of a sudden have a huge expansive wetland in the middle of the site, it really impacts things. So I think that would be a place where we might want to add some additional conditions as far as if extensions are issued, these would be conditions upon which we would issue, you know, we would consider those things and it would include making sure flagging is still in place on the site having a review process by the commission to conduct a site visit and also making sure that there are specifically conditioning no changes to the resource area boundaries on the site in any situation where a permit is issued and if there are any changes to the resource areas on a site that a, an extension can't be issued or an amendment needs to be filed 100 percent with you on that and that's sort of where i was going with the variance discussion. So it's covered elsewhere, I see my concern. Um, and that extension issue might not necessarily be in covered entirely in definitions. There might be a subsection, but that's something where we need to um, flag extensions on permits. Just making a note of these things because it's hard to keep them all straight. Um, so um, isolated wetlands are defined here now. Um, <laughs> Leroy, I'm sure you were in on this as well because when we were talking about the hills subdivision, isolated wetland versus vernal pool, there was some semantics there and like, and I think that's another area that will flag as we get further down in sections that needs to be addressed. It's a major, major hole in these regulations. Um, and Michelle, I'll just give you a quick, as long as we're looking at the definition here. So we're saying um, the isolated wetland, this is its definition. Uh, it's greater than 500 square feet. Soils are saturated, support um, predominance of wetland indicator plants. But there's a separate definition for vernal pools. So there are instances where people have said, this is an isolated wetland, but it's not a vernal pool. And they've really tried to play that to the point where an isolated wetland would not have that 100 foot protection around it. But the reality is they are essentially one in the same. And so provided that the isolated wetland has vernal pool species, um, sorry, my computer just told me it's out of battery. The vernal pools have to be inundated for like two months of the year or something, whereas perhaps an isolated wetland would not be. Right. And also, um, if a isolated wetland contained vernal pool species that could be documented, that might also be another kind of trigger on that. So, um, those are definitions that we might want to um, be very, very specific to address when we make another pass around at this. Um, 
I'm making a okay. note of it. I'm making just a note to be of clear it. though, you're in support of just like um, giving more attention and focus to this isolated wetland definition. That's okay. Got it. Yeah, to make sure that we're very, very crystal clear about what which is which and when they're one and the same because they can be they can be one in the same and they can be different. These are all changes made by others. And again, we don't have to put in linear shape project as defined by 310 CMR 10.04. All we have to say is we're referring to the definitions under the Wetland Protection Act unless there's specific ones where we're where our definition is different. Uh, language written, this just needs to come out. Um, the written application, it's just, it's the permit period. There's a lot of changes like that that needs to be, that need to be made. Permit, there's no reason for us to define a permit here. That was the attorney's recommendation. This is all kind of extra stuff that is just not essential for us to have in here. Yay, we made it to page 10 by one o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I actually had a comment on page 10. Okay. Yeah, we're on. It's for a butter notification, 3B. Oh. So it's past the section. So I guess we're, it's probably, uh, yeah, I, the document I was looking at, it was page 10, but um, it was in a butter. It's section 3B. It might be just after this. Is it the definition of a butter notice? It's a, uh, yeah. Um, okay. It's the, the cri no, it's not the definition. It's, I yeah, guess, like the- What's up? It was under the procedure section. So I think it's at the very bottom of the next page, actually going down. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, it's the definition of a butter notice. Yeah, it's under the procedure. Let's just get to section three. Oh, okay. I think it's at the end of this. There we go. Okay, got it. Better notification. Maybe it's already been changed. So it says, um, it's at the end of this first paragraph and it says mailing at least seven days prior shall constitute timely notice. I think it should be seven business days prior. Yes, absolutely. You're right, on the, you know, you right on the money, right on the money. Yeah, okay. Right you on the money, I that. require that. I require seven business days and as does DEP, it's just not written into the regs. So anytime they refer to day, they expect it to be business day, but, okay. but business I- Business is, is specified in other areas, but not here. And I thought that was, could be a little sneaky, so. Don't yeah. mind adding it. Nope, that, that's a very good catch, Michelle. Um, and as long as we're here, I mean, I haven't gotten to this section. I haven't even gotten to this section yet because I'm so busy with the first 10 pages. But just so you know, these changes here are accounting for a change that was made in the Wetland Protection Act, these red changes here. But we'll, we will dive into that next time, okay? Because we're at one o'clock and I want to respect you guys' time. But um, the, that was extremely productive. Um, thank you guys so much. And uh, we will figure out the workflow of the edits. I think, I think going through it sort of first pass, just section by section, talking about it, my suggestions, town attorney's suggestions, and then once those have all been made, let's revisit it again and go through it more with a fine tooth comb to see things like that you guys, and again, you can we can make changes at any point, but um, I'll send you this version now so you can see it. Um, just bear in mind, there's a lot of changes to the first 10 pages that still need to be done. And as we go section by section, there's gonna be a lot more changes, so. Okay, do I move to adjourn? Is that I, don't, I don't think we really need to, uh, make motions or anything like that. I think just um, if we have the consensus of everybody to adjourn and then Michelle, could you could just say we're adjourning at this time. Okay, well, we are adjourning. There's no public, right? 
No public. No, I don't see anybody attending. Right. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, we will adjourn this bylaw subcommittee meeting at 9.59 a.m. on January 7th, 2022. 9.59 a.m.? What was it? Oh, sorry. I'm on Pacific <laughs> time. <laughs> 12.59. I'm on Pacific time. Sorry. Michelle works. <laughs> Michelle's job is in, in um, California, Leroy. So. <laughs> That's funny. All right, guys. I'll probably do it again. All right. Thank, Thank you, you for everybody. your time. See you soon. Happy weekend. Thank you, Bye. Thank you Michelle, for sharing. Bye. <laughs>